Good evening, Madam Chair and Vice Chair and Board Members, Superintendent. Um, today, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about where we are academically with our district. Uh, this presentation was, uh, it's been a few days in the making. I uh, just want to kind of let you know, uh, based off a brief assessment, where we're at and what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to do the presentation and just jot down questions you may have, and we'll go back and talk about them as we go. Uh, as any good teacher would do, and I'm not going to call myself a good teacher, but we'll see. Uh, you have to have some objectives, and our objectives for today are presented here. Uh, one of the, the, the key issues is the academic affairs. Where are we at academically? What's going on? Do we have some action plans? Uh, the DOE has been talking to us a lot. I'm going to give you some very specific details on what they have told us and where we are as, as far as the state uh, is concerned. And then our uh, immediate concerns, things we need to address right away. I know that the superintendent's talked about the Boots on the Ground initiative. We're going to go through ESOL, talk about your LEA profile. We're going to talk about the acronyms that we throw around with these schools a lot and what a top school actually is and a watch list, uh, the overarching academic concerns, and we're going, where are we going, what, what are we doing? If you look at the next presentation we have several uh, principals on assignment that are here we have visited every school miss king was with me last friday and we visited two schools we did five yesterday and i've seen some of you at some schools but they have all been contacted and when we go and we talk to them the first thing we're asking the principal and miss king was there what do you need how can we help you what what's happening uh, we have made it a a legitimate conversation but then we're going to talk to the teachers after the christmas break and say what do you need? How can we help you help students? I want to stop and, and really kind of reflect on bullet number two. Two weeks ago, we had a, a conversation with DOE, a phone conversation about several things that we'll identify tonight as we go through the presentation. But we had DOE today with us. We had two people from DOE and talked to Dr. Mayer and Dr. Helm and myself. Um, and there are some legitimate concerns. It was, we kind of came to a screeching halt and went, uh-oh. It was, and I'm going to talk about that as we go, but they are, there are some pressing needs we have to address. Uh, we, and you'll see as, we start, as I start unpacking these schools and where we are, uh, it was one of those moments where you just look at each other and go, we, ha we have work to do. And I'm going to kind of tell you that. But I, I do want to say again, today in a meeting we went, wow, this is, this is significant and we have to, uh, to fix what's going on. One of the biggest indicators to us, and I'm just going to, be as honest as I know how to be. Um, the gentleman told us that two and a half years ago, he gave our district a prediction, a predictor for our schools. And it outlined you have, and they labeled them as a green, a yellow, or a red school. And the majority of our schools were red. And he said that nothing was done with that. So he said, we tried, DOE tried to tell you this two and a half years ago, and nothing has taken place. So when we heard that, we were embarrassed, but we didn't, we have to correct it now. So I asked the gentleman, can you do us another predictor? And, the, and he actually called it a risk factor assessment. So I want to generically speak on that. You can have an A school that still has low performing students. And he was saying, just because you're an A now does not necessarily mean you'll be an A in two years from now or three years from now. And we all know that school letter grades are not the end all be all, but if they were predicting almost three years ago, we should have looked at it and said, what's going on? And he, his comment, well, we told you and nobody listened. So we are listening right now. We're, we're listening. Um, the alignment and the restructuring, our superintendent has said multiple times, we've got to get back to the student level, to the classroom level. We're looking at every position in this district and saying, how do you impact children? And if there's no direct impact, then why, or why does your position exist? Action plan. So after we talk about this, when we come to you in the work session, we're going to show you very strategic, very specific action plans as how we plan to correct and how we will correct what's going on. The ESAW. I'm going to just let you kind of read this. I'm certainly not going to read it to you. The ESAW, or ESAW students are coming in and ordinarily an ESOL student is labeled ESOL for two to three years. That's very typical. DOE has a, a ranking or an average system where they come and say this 
percentage of your students has been in the ESOL program for more than five years. So if, if I'm telling you that two to three years is typical, more than five years is atypical. We, that's not what we want to see. We have had some students, multiple students, that have been in ESOL for 13 years. And add those grades up. So what's happening? What's going on? So again, let me kind of reiterate. Two to three is typical. We're above the state average for what's normal. And we had some students that were there 13 years. And we're going to kind of talk about what that looks like. And I see your eyes, Ms. McCall, and that's, my eyes are a little crazier than that when, when I heard that, for sure. Our LEA profile, and again, we're defining acronyms because we throw acronyms around quite a bit. Um, we're going to talk about these very specifically. And the data that we're using, you'll see these 14 indicators that we're about to talk about. The state changed the rules of the game, like is very typical. When a student goes through a child study team or there's some kind of identification process for there might be some ESE concerns they need to visit, it used to be, and I'm going to say back in the day, a few years ago, you had 60 uh, school days to find out what's going on and have some kind of assessment done. Now it's 60 calendar days. So as you see uh, what we're talking about in a few minutes, you'll see are we complying with that or not. We're going to talk about the, the bottom quite a bit, the restraint and seclusion as we go. But these are the indicators for what ESC and DOE say needs assessment or needs assistance. This is that goal that says according in 2014, 2015, we identified a student might have some ESC needs or some, needs some extra support. We were at 91% in 2014, 2015. In 2015, we were at 94.8%. That looks pretty good, but the expectation is 100% because you're talking about a child that's not being diagnosed or is not being served correctly and, and getting the proper supports that they need. So again, that looks great, but imagine if that was your child that missed that, that support that was needed. This slide we have found is not the information that was presented is not correct. That has changed. These were predictor scores, so I'm going to ask you to bear with me on this slide, and when I come to you in this session, I'm going to give you some more accurate information. This is, a, a not, this is not very indicative of what's going on, so just kind of we'll, we'll get through this slide, and we'll come back and in the work session give you very specific data with that. This is the one that um, is okay. You see the state average, but again, we're talking about children here. We're still lower than the state average, and you see it went down in 2015, 2016. And this is the least restrictive environment where we're trying to include students and trying to have them in the, in the best possible setting. This is the one that concerned me when I heard this from on the conference call of DOE. Restraint, we're at 3.44%, and the state average is 0.94%. Look at seclusion, the state average is 1.72, and we're at 0.17%. So we have some issues of that, and we have a plan for that as how we're going to address what's going on. Okay, here comes jargon all over the place. So I'm going to slow it down a little bit, and I'm going to talk about what the tops, and we call them the eight, and we call them four. So I'm going to go a little slower when we talk about how these are classified and how these are categorized. Our top plan, and you can see, and if you have a handout and it's black, I want you to pay attention to the red letters. That was when we transitioned from FCAT to FSA, and, and they said the scores didn't count. Remember, we had this waiver period where it, it really wasn't uh, there. So the planning stage, these are the planning schools for us right now. And again, I'm not going to read this to you, but if you have two Ds or D and F combo some kind of way, you're considered a planning school which means you're planning for, for what's happening to make school improvements, and that's something we've had conversations about a lot today. So I'm just going to use the, the first one, Fessenden. They were an F, and they were a D, so that combination makes them a planning school. So in our district, we currently have, you can see, four schools. Marion Virtual is a little different. We talked to DOE about that today and why that was. It's hard to maintain. It's hard to monitor virtual schools. We have some ideas about why we're not performing. But for planning purposes, consider DOE, we have four schools. This is the four top school that you hear a lot. These are the schools we're really paying attention to. 
And you see the combination, again, the, the red does not count, so go back to the previous grade. So I'm just going to use evergreen. They have an F in 2016, a D, and then a D. So that's why those are all these schools are here. And you know that you've heard these schools over and over again, but that's how they differ from the planning school. These are the schools that we have to, and this is where DOE really comes in heavy and says, hey, and they can make, and they do make recommendations based on what they're seeing if you're in this level here. We do not have any level twos yet. I'm going to try to explain the level two versus the level one. The level two is DOE says to us after we present a plan, yes or no. They have the authority to say, no, we're not doing that. You know, you, you've heard, I'm going to make you a charter school. You have to do this. So level one, I'm going to go back to level one. They sit with us and work with us for level one, and they say, okay, we agree to do that. Level two, the superintendent, or I would go to DOE, we present to the chancellor, the chancellor simply says yes or no. We do not have any level twos yet, but I want to go back. If you look at these, we are predicting, we are predicting that some of these, I would say two of these schools are going to be in level two category next year based off some common assessments, and then it's a different game when you go to DOE. Uh, and you have to, and I think you, if, if you read in the paper, Polk County went, recently went through that. They had to go, and their plans got denied, and they went back and forth. And it's not a pleasant place to be, but it, it, unless I'm predicting incorrectly, I'm with two of those schools are probably going to be. These are the watch list. If you have a D and a D, then you become that category. So here are currently our 2016 grades. And all these schools are D's. Some of these schools, if, if we are calculating correctly, will be a D again or an F. And, and I know this is a lot, but it's, I'm, I'm going to give you the whole, the whole thing at one time. This is how that looks on one sheet of paper. Is it overwhelming? Yes, it is. But I wanted you to see this from us and see what we're we're doing it in kind of our plan. So if you look at this, um, and, and I, as I looked at that predictor score that the gentleman showed us today, the majority of our schools are red, not yellow, not green. This is saying the same exact thing, that the majority of our schools are in dire need for support and help. Again, the, the bottom schools, uh, they will be in the planning stage. Some of those will be in the planning stage next year. Some of the middle schools will be in the implementing stage next year. Some of the higher schools will be in level two, where it's a direct conversation between the chancellor of education and our superintendent. There's more. We have several schools in the lowest 300 <coughs> in the state, and that's ranking. And I want to show you what these numbers on the right mean. The higher the number, the higher the number, the lower the score, and that's a little, uh, I guess, disproportionate. So, for example, 29th is a higher grade than 290. That means they're 29 spots away from being out of the bottom 300. That's how the rank is. So it's a little. So, the lesser, the better. The 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 least number is the better number in this. Uh, if you look at this, you see the T's by Emerald Shore, Sunrise, and Evergreen. Those are our top schools as well, the top school that we talked about earlier. Here's what we're looking at. After Christmas break, this is how many instructional days we have. And we stress all the time, you can't have a substitute. You got to be in front of students. Every day is important. This is why. Look at uh, the, the writing assessments. You have 34 instructional day in front of students to turn something that is low performing right now. Look at the reading assessment. You have 58 days, 58 instructional days to, to make some changes. There's always issues when you take FSA in third grade. These are a few of the issues. Um, we, we talk about in third grade, that's where it gets serious. And I would also venture to say that's when kids don't start, like, they, they start not liking to go to school. And, and hence, this is where the accountability kicks in. We've got to kind of change some of that. Um, the school grade and the, and the calculations, 
again, if you're an A school or a B school, you still have kids that need support at a different level. And the all students is the big deal. The lower quartile, no matter what the lower quartile is, has to show growth. They have to show growth. Oftentimes you'll have one student that hits three or four different cells and how your school grades calculated. So that, that one student means a lot for your school, but more importantly, you need to pay, to them, pay attention to them try to, and try to help them get up where they're supposed to be. These are big concerns that we're seeing in the schools. You probably have heard this much more than I have. We have a serious attendance problem. Um, I used to say as a principal, if a substitute's better than a teacher, then I need to hire the substitute. We have to have teachers, we have to have staff at work. Uh, we, we go around the schools and we'll walk into and the principal will say, oh, we got a sub in here. We'll go to the next class, oh, we have a sub in here. That, if, if we only have 34 days of instruction, those days are very, very important. A substitute is not, will never take the place of a teacher. The students, I was at a school visiting, I was there very early. School started at 7.45 and it was 8.30 and kids were still getting dropped off. And it was just constant. There was no, it has to be so severe that you miss school, that you're missing so much instructional time. But if I'm going into a substitutes classroom, maybe it's not that way. Maybe the relevance isn't where it needs to be. But the students are not coming like they should too. And I know we have our attendance matters and we're having those kind of conversations. But if I'm not there as an instructional teacher or staff and my kids aren't there and I'm performing low, I don't know how I'm going to survive that. So we have, we have an attendance problem on both the adult level and the student level. Reading, uh, we're going to talk about this ad nauseum, I would say, in, in the work session. We do a lot of interventions in reading but not a lot of tier one instruction in reading. We, got it. we really have to shift that. Uh, I ask a principal about what are you doing for your students that are on grade level? And the answers were intervention, intervention. Well, and I'm gonna to explain to you what that is when we do the work session. There's more than interventions when you talk about reading and instruction. Reading again is not a curriculum that you hand out. That's not the silver bullet or everybody would be performing in reading. Curriculum is, it helps you with standards and how you teach reading. Ms. King and I had a conversation, but reading is very, very difficult to teach. It's extremely difficult to teach. It's not something that, that most of us could go do. And so we have to pro provide some PD for that. The last one is standards. Standards is what drives your instruction. You should use curriculum for that. You should use whatever you have in your toolkit for that. But standards is what you are supposed to be teaching to. However you choose to teach to that is, is up to the teacher. I visit several classrooms and our principals have visited several classrooms. There's no standards on the wall. And what do we do? We ask the students, what are you learning today? And they say they don't know. You have to know what's the objective today? What are the, what's it, what standards is it based off and how are we going to get there? And more importantly, how are you going to assess me if I know it? So we have, we have several uh, things to talk about. The last piece is, is it's been bothering me for a long, long time. We talked about it in the superintendent's cabinet yesterday. We have 57 vacancies on the books. That's what's showing. That bothers me more than you'll ever know. But it's more than that. We have teachers in the classroom that have bachelor's degree. That does not mean you're certified to be a teacher. I visited a, a principal yesterday and the principal said, I hired this lady contingent upon her passing her certification test. And she failed all four parts of her certification test. So just because there's a warm person in front of students does not mean that's a highly qualified teacher. So this is a huge concern for our district. And I would say this, when we talk to DOE, the biggest complaint they say to us is you cannot have substitutes in the classes and in the schools that need the best teachers you got. Because we're showing six vacancies, eight vacancies daily. Uh, there, was, there are some schools in this district that have not had a teacher yet. They've had a sub since the first day of school until now. Now that sounds, uh, but if that was your child or my child, you'd be very <laughs> upset. But I'm thinking about the quality of instruction. And not only that, that doesn't mean the sub's been there every day. It might be a different person. So just imagine here's Christmas break and you haven't had a qualified, competent person in front of kids today. What is the point of assessment if it's not helping improve or guide instruction? We have some misalignment with FSA specs and what we're doing. I ask a question, why do we give that assessment if it's not aligned to standards? And the answer I got was, I don't know. Or to compare teachers to other teachers. That's not the point of assessment. We all know we over-assess. We need to assess to guide instruction, 
to maybe even provide professional development for the instruction that's needed. So the assessment is just a test if it has no meaning behind it. Uh, you can't, you can't over-test, and I think we might do that collectively as a state. You need to have meaningful assessments, not a ton of assessments. So you need to have several quali just high-quality assessments that shows you show a teacher how to teach. The next two things, um, I, I say this and we all say this, we work for the little people, not the big people. We work for the little folks, the kids. We're here for students every day. If it can't touch, or if your position or whatever you may be called can't directly touch students, then why are you here? That's the questions we ask. Sure, that's a position, but is it needed to help students? So when we're walking around looking at people on our side of the house, we're going, if we have 57 teaching vacancies, is that job really important? So that's the kind of conversations we're having. Alignment of task. Um, we hire people that hire great people that allow them to do their job. We have to find a way to touch adults that are going to help teachers help students. So the alignment of task, if we can't show a correlation with how that's going to help a child perform, then we have, we have some serious issues. Um, this is what I'm hearing from teachers as I bump into them. And you'll be surprised. They'll come running and say, hey, let me tell you what's going on. This big D word that we throw around that we don't really know the definition of means that we treat people differently, not the same. One lady told me she has gone to the same PD the last three years, and, and it's Harry Wong. And we know what Harry Wong, and that's great. But after a while, classroom management is classroom management. You need something else. So what do you need? How about based off an assessment, what do you need PD with? And then we provide the PD for you. You can't tell great teachers what to do. Great teachers know what to do. You have to ask them what to do. So this buy-in is huge. Show us what you need. We're going to find the experts and help you do that. And then they'll, it'll, they'll, they'll buy in a little more. The stakeholder piece, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this as we kind of get toward the end. This is not an I. This is not a they. This is not blank. This is a we deal. We have to fix this. We, we, the kids, because we're failing students. We can't fail students anymore. We have to, to get everybody in the mix. That's the community, too. We've had some community outreach the last couple of weeks. And you know, we all say the adage, it takes a village to raise a child. A parent can't drop the students off at 745 and pick them up at 3 and think we're going to fix them. It's everybody. So the all stakeholders is, is everybody. If you want to say this, hold me accountable, please. Hold everybody that works for us accountable based off what's best for students. Now, we're going to fight some of the assessments with the state. That's some conversations we're going to have. But we have, if, if there's not qualified teachers in the classroom, that's our fault, and we're going to fix that. That's the principal's fault. We're going to fix that. We have to hold each other accountable and have some tough conversations because it's not about the big people. It's about the little people. So please hold me accountable. Let, let's, see, let's see what we can do. The work session, we're going to bring, bring very detailed, very specific strategies to you. But for the purpose of the general audience, we didn't want to bore them to death. Uh, it's going to be a couple hours and just show you this is, this is the issue, this is how we're going to address it, here's the timeline, and here's how we're going to assess it. So it's going to be very specific and very strategic. So as we wrap up, we, I hope we kind of went all over, went through that. I want to show you something. This is me being hokey, okay? This is, but I want to get to you and I want you to know how my brain works. When I ask my son if he wants to go to school, I want him to say yes. He's in fifth grade. I don't want him to say no. There was a day where we all loved school. And when does it stop loving school? So this is what I want you to think about when you go to school. This is what I want school to be like when we show up for school. And if you haven't seen this, I apologize, but this is how my brain works so you know how, uh, what you're dealing with, okay? So will you show that for me? Make a wish. Count to three. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Take a look and you'll see into your imagination. We'll begin 
with a spin Traveling in the world of my creation What we'll see will defy Explanation If you want to view paradise Simply look around and view it Anything you want to do it Want to change the world There's nothing to it Hurry up, pilot! This way, Grandpa! No life I know to compare with pure imagination. Living there, you'll be free if you truly wish to be. So, as silly as that may seem, that's what it should be. It should be imagination, it should be inquiry, it should be fun. Learning should be fun. And, and somewhere along the way, we lost that, and I believe we can find that, and we will. We do, have, we do have to hold everybody's hand. We do have to be accountable. But if you have children, that's what it should be like. And you saw the adults enjoyed that too. So we're going to get back to some of that and ask the question why. And what do you want to be when you grow up? And then we're going to try to help you become that. So I, I believe that is, that is it. And if you have questions, please fire away. <laughs> 